because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Before we get started with this week's podcast, I wanted to let you know that Access is now open to the Basketball Immersion Platinum Collective Mastermind. This is an exclusive private next level coaching development program for a very specific coach. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash platinum to learn more. Coach is really excited today to have Coach Gail Gessencore is with us. Coach G, former head coach at Duke in Texas, 75% winning percentage. I mean, the list goes on and on, Coach, but uh, four final fours and a ton of success everywhere you have been. Uh, first off, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks so much, Chris. I've really enjoyed listening to your podcast. Well, thank you for that. And I know we're going to get a lot out of this conversation. And I mean, twofold, tremendous coaching career as a head coach, transitioned into a little bit of a career as an assistant coach, and now co-founder of Coaching Full Circle, which is consulting, advising, and mentoring basketball coaches with Carol Ross, who in and of herself was a tremendous coach, a NCAA and WNBA coach too. So what a great thing. Can you tell us a little bit about this, uh, Coaching Full Circle Consulting? Yeah, we just, our goal is just really what you said. We want to mentor coaches in any way, shape, or form that we can. And uh, it's been very interesting and enlightening for us because, you know, every coach needs a little bit something different. So, you know, we've had some coaches that are first-year coaches, coaches that have played in the WNBA, coaches that have never been head coaches before. And then we have some that have been coaches for 30 years that just want some fresh eyes and fresh ideas. So it's interesting because as we're mentoring and leading and coaching, we're really coaching coaches. We're also learning a great deal at the same time because everybody has a different style. So we've really enjoyed becoming invested in our coaches, in their teams and in their journey. Well, I love that. And that's one of the many valuable reasons why you're going to be such a great guest is that you're now experiencing a lot of different philosophies and a lot of different approaches being a consultant as well as your background in coaching. So you're going to be able to bring a lot of those thoughts together for us. Let's start. We're going to circle back to a lot of the consulting and some questions related to that. But let's start with how have you personally evolved through the phases of your career was that mainly a player-led, basketball-led, or personally-led? What things have led to you changing throughout your career? Wow. Well, I think it was really all three. First and foremost, I think player-led. You know, I've always been a people person. I've always really enjoyed my relationships with my players. It's the reason that you coach, I hope, you know, is for the players. So I would say I've evolved because of my players. I remember when I first got the head job at Duke University, I tried to be like Lynn Dunn. She was my boss when I was an assistant at Purdue. So I tried to do everything she did, you know, because it was successful. And I realized through working with my players as well, they know when you're not authentic and they know when you don't exactly know what you're doing and it's not your comfort zone. So I think they helped me really to evolve and become myself. Because when you're coaching, you have to be yourself. You can't try to be somebody else. And just because something works for somebody else does not mean it's going to work for you. I also remember early on thinking, because they ask so many questions, and, and because I wasn't confident at the time, I thought they're questioning me as a coach. But they weren't. They just needed to know the why. Why are we doing this? And then when they understood the why, it made us so much better than they could buy in when they understood it. It made sense. So I think always I've learned as much as I've taught my players, I think I've learned from my players, but it's been an evolution. You know, it used to be the hard line, my way or the highway kind of, that's how I started, you know, wanting to demand the respect instead of understanding that it was much more fulfilling for everybody. And we were much more successful if it was a collaborative effort. So I really, as I grew older and gained confidence as a coach and a leader, 
I became much more trusting, much more collaborative. And I think everybody felt better about the way things that were going and we became much more successful. It's great. And I've heard this from so many coaches at the NBA and the WNBA level, just as you move up in levels, how the players are more demanding on making sure that you know what you're doing as a coach. And it's, it's not like you're coaching something different. It's just that you need more of the why behind it because, again, it makes sense that they're smarter, they're more aware, they've been coached by a bunch of different people and more philosophies. And did you find that too along your career path from moving from head coach to WNBA? Most definitely. I think I learned so much in the WNBA. I mean, those coaches, they're amazing. And, uh, you know, it's such a compact season that they have to teach and they have to scout so quickly and move through things. You know, they've got back to backs and they're, they're getting so much done in a matter of six months. So, I mean, you are, it is a full out sprint when you're in the WNBA. But one thing that I did learn that was so helpful is, and this was with uh, USA basketball as well, you know, serving on those Olympic staffs. It's those players, they're wise beyond their years. You know, they've been in the grind and and the WNBA players and the Olympians, they all play overseas. So that's where I really came to understand. They knew more about player personnel than I could ever know. You know, when you're playing all these teams from Australia and China, Japan, wherever it may be, they all knew those players because they play overseas in the off season. So they became the best scouts. You know, we might know the plays, diagram the plays, but they knew all of the tendencies. So it really became a collaborative effort with those players because they helped me as a scout and as an assistant coach to know the best way really to attack certain players, certain teams, certain styles of play. So you have to really be willing to be a student, you know, and be taught and learn. So when I went back to college, you know, after I was coaching the Olympics, I was so much better. I included my players. And really, that's when I started having a player assigned to do scouting reports. Every player was going to do a scouting report with a coach. So instead of just your coaches regurgitating things to the players, the players now would watch tape with the coach. They break down the opponent and they present the scouting report with that coach to the team. And I think that was such an advantage in so many ways. One, because we were spending one-on-one time with that player. Two, we were watching videotape, not of ourselves, but of our opponent. So it helped them to really learn to analyze the game. And then three, there was that sense of ownership. They were invested. And so it would get to the point where, you know, we'd be in a game and say a three-point shooter hit the shot, hit a three, We'd have the player yelling at her teammates, I told you guys she was a three-point shooter. You know, so all of a sudden they started doing more of the coaching, which which really helped. And again, above and beyond that, it's about, and coaches ask this all the time, how do we develop leaders? How do we develop better communicators? Well, you're putting them immediately in situations where they're going to be uncomfortable and they have to figure it out. I love that part of it. And I've seen that in a number of programs but maybe not to the extent that you're talking about. So can you dive into that a little bit more? How did you help the players become more comfortable with that? Because I imagine some of the freshmen especially would struggle with that concept. Yeah, and I never gave the freshmen one of the early games because I knew (laughs) they'd be peeing their pants. So this was something that we worked up to, but we always had someone who'd done it before, usually one of the seniors start off with the scouting reports so they could see how it was done. But there were some other ways that we also, I love putting the players in front of the team throughout the season because I know it helps them in so many ways to just be able to gain confidence and have those leadership qualities. So some of the other things that I did to prepare them for the scouting, you know, we did book reports. So that's another way. I love reading and I think it can be so motivational for coaches and for players. And so I would assign each player a book depending on what I thought might help them. They had to read the book and do, we called it book reports, but it was basically just a short synopsis of the book report. And then they had to stand in front of the team talk about the lessons that they took away from that book. 
So that was another way for me to get them to dive a little bit deeper into themselves and then open up to their teammates and talk about different things that that they might have learned. So there were a variety of things that we did just to get them in front of the team where if you're in front of a team, that's your comfort zone, you know, as close as you can get to being in an environment where everybody's going to care for and love you. So if they could do it in front of the team, then I knew they would be comfortable doing it in front of a classroom or in front of, you know, an audience for out in the community. So I think it helped in a variety of ways. It's great because again, as coaches, we tend to dominate too much. So finding ways to be able to empower players in different ways is tremendous. And are there some other things that come to mind in ways that you empowered your players to be more involved? And I assume this evolved through your coaching career as well. It did. It did. See, some of the other things we did would be actually on the court. And this is something they absolutely did not like, but I thought it was very beneficial is Depending on the drill, I might just select two random captains and I'd say, okay, this is going to be a rebounding drill. The losers are going to run, you know, so pick your teams. And then they had those two players had to pick the teams. You know, we'd alternate. And now the next day I might say, okay, we're going to do a defensive drill. Losers are going to run and I'll pick two different captains. Now you pick the teams. So it put them in a situation where they had to decide, okay, it's a rebounding drill. Am I going to pick the best rebounder? Am I going to pick my best friend? (laughs) And you didn't want to be the last one picked, but in in a lot of times the last ones picked are the ones I'd say, you know, you can't be picked last in everything because everybody's got to bring something to the table, you know, something to the team. So putting them in a situation and sometimes they say, coach, I don't want to do it. I said, you know what, this is what I have to do every single day. When we have a game, I have to pick five to put out. You think I want to put 15, I want to put you all out on the court or start you all, but I can't. So now you understand as well that it's not that easy. It's difficult. And you have to decide who can get a rebound for us or who can defend or whatever it may be, who can score. Um, And then, and it puts them in a situation again where they're in front of the team. They've got to make some tough choices. The idea in terms of sociology of it is that now for you as a coach too, I mean, if certain players come to you and talk about playing time or different things like that, it's not that you want to use this against them, but in a way it brings some reality to what you're saying to players in the sense that your your teammates think this too. It's not just me. Yeah. So it was very helpful for me as a coach because I wasn't the one telling them their teammates were showing them with who they were picking. So it made my job a lot easier. Well, I love that. And you've visited obviously through, consulting, you've worked with a number of coaches, number of programs, different levels, et cetera, and then throughout your career. But how do you see coaches innovating in today's game? Are there some things that stand out to you that uh, say, hey, listen, these are some ideas that other coaches should be uh, applying because you see these things helping a coach or helping a team progress in this modern game? Yeah, I feel like coaches now, I mean, they're so much more involved with social media. So that's First and foremost, I mean, that's the way that the younger generation operates many times. So you have got to be able to find a way to connect with the players that you're recruiting and with your own team. And right in, right now, we all know that many of them are on social media a majority of the time. So you've got to become your friend. And that's what I see. You know, a lot of programs now, they've got people that are just hired to do all of their social media. So it looks the stabs are getting bigger and bigger. And I feel like the coaches are really, for the most part, doing a great job of utilizing their staff members so that everything is covered. Analytics, you know, everybody's now into analytics. I mean, that wasn't, we didn't, I didn't even know what that name was really, you know, when I was coaching so long ago. So that now has become the trend, you know, just really putting some statistics behind what you're saying and what you're doing, you know, making sure you're, you're getting it right. I think one of the things that is really what I've seen working with some of these coaches, they're doing such a good job of really trying to take care of the total student athlete. So, you know, not only do they have their academic advisors, but now they've got sports psychologists that they can talk to, you know, and that just didn't, we just didn't have those things available to us at long ago. So I feel like they're really trying to tend 
and help the entire student athlete emotionally, physically, mentally, so that they're prepared not just for the moment, for the game, but for the rest of their lives. In terms of style of play then, or even practices, have you noticed a difference in practices that, you know, from program to program, obviously there's differences, but just in general, we've talked about how you communicate to players, that it's, it's a different era, it's a different generation, but also we're more sensitive and more aware of what we're saying. And social media has brought a lot of that to light as well. Do you find coaches are different in practice nowadays? Well, it's hard to say. You know, I've seen so many practices, not just through my consulting, but when I, I worked for four years with ESPN and I probably saw over 200 practices during that time. So it was very beneficial because I saw so many different styles and I was able to see, you know, not one style fits everyone and, and you can be effective with many different styles. So I think that was really good for me to see. I think one thing now that we have in college, you've got the time restrictions on how many hours you can practice a week. So it's really forced coaches to become more effective and more efficient with their time and with their, the student athletes time. So I think that's the biggest thing I've noticed is that there's not as much dead time. There's not as much lag time. It's like, all right, we're in, let's get after it. We've got two hours, let's get it done. You know, and they're very effective. And I think also they become much more positive, you know, because we've had some situations where players have come forward and said that there was verbal abuse or, you know, whatever you may have. So it's like, you really have to make sure you stay positive. You can get your message across. You just got to find a good, positive way to get it across. You don't have to be negative. You don't have to yell. uh, You don't have to degrade. You can find a positive way to help people be the best they can possibly be. And that's the other thing when you talk about back to innovation kind of hand in hand is now coaches are doing personality types, you know, finding the best way. This is their personality. This is how they're best motivated. This is how they can best hear what I have to say. So really trying to find the best way and the most efficient and effective way to get things done. And going back to your WNBA experience, you talked about the level of coaching, the quality of players. I'm curious, what are some things that you from your WNBA experience would bring back to your college coaching? What are some things that you think transfer back in terms of helping you be a better coach from your experience in the WNBA? Yeah, I think they treat the players like adults, you know, for the most part. It's it's very collaborative. Everything is very, whether it's the scouting report, whether it's when they're going to practice, what they're going to do in practice, how best to defend something, it's very collaborative. So I think that I like to think I was collaborative. I think it would go to another level after having been in the WNBA. I also think, you know, just really trusting my assistants, you know, they, somebody's got the offense, somebody's got the defense, somebody's got special situations. So just really trusting, you're still going to, you know, have the, the last say, but really trusting the assistants. I think the pros do a great job of that. And then special situations. I mean, they are masters in special situations. I think the college game, now that it's gone for women to four quarters, they're now starting to catch on to all that can be done and the advantages you can gain through having the best sideline out of bounds plays. And knowing, you know, now we're going to advance it. Now we have fouls to give. Give a foul instead of giving up a fast break. All those little nuances that in the college game you just really didn't see it's now we're having that trickle down effect finally, but the pros have been doing that for years and years, just really way ahead of the game. And I've said before, when I was working with ESPN, I would recommend to any college coach go to WNBA, the preseason practices, because they're really phenomenal because they have to put in so much so quickly. So they're, they're the most efficient with their time. Well, I've said that to many coaches in general is just because so many coaches that listen to this podcast and many of us who have had international experiences like you've had, by the way, coach, we both coached in the Jones Cup. How about that? (laughs) Did you have a typhoon while you were there? (laughs) I was very fortunate. We did not. We had glorious weather. So you had to experience that, did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had to go into a shelter for a couple of days. So it was quite the experience. That is crazy. But thinking about those short timelines, and I've recommended to coaches that the WNBA represents the best example 
of trying to prepare your high school team, your AAU team, your international team, because again, such a short window to get ready to play really high level basketball. What are some things that you've noticed from that condensed training camp? I imagine they just remove the fluff, right? They get to the point. Absolutely. Yeah. They just, and you know, I think they're an advantage in that they don't do any conditioning at all because they expect the players, this is their job. So they expect the players to come in in shape and they usually are because they're coming from overseas. So there's no running. There's no, there are no sprints. Very rarely will you see a sprint because they're just going to get after it. I would say every single drill is a competitive drill. There is a winner, there is a loser, but it is all about competing because it's come down to competition. You know, when you're in the games, it's the the physically and mentally toughest that usually survive. So every drill is a competition. They do a tremendous job with special situations, you know, and that's something even the one thing that I did that, that I really thought was beneficial is, and I recommend to the coaches we work with, is we would treat every time there was a water break, we timed it. It was a 30 second water break. We treated it like a timeout. When they came out of that 30 second water break, then we were running a special situation because not only do the players need to work on special situations, so do the coaches. So it would be a random special situation where one of my assistants might say, okay, your, your team's down one, you know, with 20 seconds left, one time out, just little things to keep me on my toes as a coach, but also, you know, have our players prepared. I love it because again, it follows what, what I talk about a lot, which is creating some randomness to practice, which is how the game is like special situations don't evolve in these scripted manners. Like a lot of drills that we try and simulate them. These present more random. Hey, listen, you're just off of this situation here. Now we got this situation. Let's go. And I love that. So Mm -hmm. uh, have you tried that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we'll have the players just be the coaches. So the players have to decide how are they going to defend this last play and and what offense are they going to run? So it's, uh, again, putting players in situations where they're the decision makers. I think that's so vital. The other thing you brought up, which which this may not be a popular opinion, but division one men's and women's basketball players that I've seen are the most conditioned people on the planet. For what reason, I sometimes don't understand because I think about all that time that we invest in conditioning and think about, okay, would we not benefit the player more to just get them more skilled and more able to make decisions because skill trumps just about everything. And how conditioned do you need to be to play a 40 minute game with, again, you would know the number of stoppages in play, but a lot of stoppages in play. So there's this over exaggeration, I feel of conditioning. Have you noticed that or am I off base? I'm with you 100% and different coaches have different philosophies. So I'm still at times you still see a lot of running. Uh, Some coaches don't do as much, but, and I, I feel like it's the same way with the weight room because some of these players, they're lifting like football players. They're not football players. I mean, I just think they're, and it's moving in a different direction where it's more sports specific, which is important. You want them to be strong. You want them to be healthy and you want them to be in shape. But I always felt like and feel even more so today after having been with the WNBA and the and USAB that players, they can play them way, their way into shape. I would rather have them scrimmaging and getting touches and getting the feel for the game and playing through chaos and getting in shape that way rather than just putting them on the line. They're, they're not learning any basketball skill when they're on the line. The game is the best conditioner. I love that. You, you absolutely nailed that one. What are some neglected special situations then? You've talked about the importance, you know, after having been to these programs and all these different experiences, what are some that you feel maybe are neglected by coaches that we should be focusing more attention to? Well, I think definitely the sideline out of bounds because those are going to, you're going to win and lose so many games. I can't tell you how many games come down to the last minute of the game and knowing okay, now we want to advance. This is the play we want to run if we need a three, if we need a two. That, to me, is the biggest. And fouls to give. So many times teams have fouls to give and the game ends. And it's like you you had a foul to give. You know, you you could have made them take it out of bounds. And they just, they aren't utilizing their fouls to give. Or if you, and if you have a foul to give, not letting somebody just go for a fast break layup. You know, get them early. 
So those are probably the top things in my mind that I've seen over and over again. And I think, I think coaches are definitely getting better. You know, it took a couple of years. I think this is going to be the third year that we've had the four quarters, but it's still still has a ways to go. I'm still, to me, that, that's why you need to do it several times a day in every single practice, because it's not just about the players. The players all have to be on the same page, but the coaching staff has to be thinking, okay, what do we have? How many fouls to give? They've got to be clear. They've got to be concise with the players and, and know what the game plan is. And you've got to practice that. That doesn't just happen in a game. It happens in practice. Yeah, it's good stuff. And again, it just brings such awareness to it. And just to clarify for coaches, I mean, the NCAA women's game advances the ball under one minute, right, coach? Correct, correct. And then obviously all your FIBA experiences, they advance in under two minutes. But the NCAA men's game hasn't gone to this yet. And most, I don't think any high school federation in the U.S. has. But basically everywhere Mm -hmm. else in the world, these sideline out of bounds plays and advancing the ball are so important. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, I definitely see so much of that. Have you seen anything defensively on sideline out of bounds that's that's struck you as a a really effective idea or something? Because I get asked that a lot. Hey, coach, a brief interruption from the podcast. Have you ever wanted to visit collegiate practices? Have you ever wanted to spend a weekend immersed in basketball development? Stimulate your coaching and spend a weekend with basketball immersion as we tour a number of collegiate practices. October 18th to 20th. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash practice tour to learn more. All practice visits will be followed by debrief sessions and discussions designed to augment learning. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash practice tour to learn more. Now back to our podcast. Well, I think a couple of things that, that you can do, you know, is you can go zone, switch your defense. You know, if you've been man to man, just all of a sudden go zone. That blows up, a, you know, a man play nine times out of 10. Trap the ball handler or, you know, and the pros do a great job with this, trapping the best player. It's like, we don't care. We will let anybody else shoot the ball, but we're going to trap and rotate. So whenever that best player gets the ball, like, you know, star defense, the best player gets the ball, we're, we're going to go trap her wherever she is, and then we'll rotate out of it and we'll take our chances, but not letting, because in the pro so many times, you know who the, the best player is and nine times out of 10, they're going to hit that buzzer shot. So you're not going to let that happen. Make somebody else beat you. It's amazing how many times that does happen though, that we, we still, <laughs> we still let the best player get the shot. And I've talked about that with a number of coaches. Uh, another thing that came up as you're talking about special situations, and I'm sure you have some insights on this is, as a coach, there's so many things to manage during a game, especially as, as the head coach. So what were some things that you did to help you manage special situations, maybe using your staff or using a game card? What are some different things that you did to help manage these? Yeah, well, I always had somebody that was in charge of, one of my assistants in charge of special situations. So, and she would always have my top five plays that I wanted to run if we were doing a sideline out of bounds, you know, depending on what the, the case may be, but she would have the top five and I had them on big diagrams, not a little diagram, but a big diagram. So if it was a stressful situation, I could just pull out the diagram. You know, she, she, I'd say, okay, get my top three and she'd give them to me. And then I could look at them and I could either still diagram or I could just put it down on my board and go, okay, ladies, here's what we're doing. They're always, things that were in our playbook that we had worked on many, many times, but I always wanted to have my assistant and I'd tell her sometimes it'd be a five point game with five minutes. I'd be just point at her and go, get, okay, get my plays ready. Cause it's coming, you know, you can just feel it. So yeah, just constantly working on these things in practice so that I felt comfortable, but then also having a staff and that's, you know, that's the other thing as a head coach, having your staff know their roles, know their responsibilities and be comfortable in those responsibilities. And that's another thing we talk about practicing with our players, but we got to practice with our assistant coaches as well. So, you know, sometimes we, when we're running a scrimmage, we treat it like a game, just like a game so that my staff and I could all be practicing what we needed to be really good with come the end of the game. What a great point that is. That's awesome. Can you shed some more light on that, Coach, then? Some of the ways that you do that? Because it doesn't just have to happen within a scrimmage, but maybe some other parts of practice, just phases of practice. But uh, can you talk about that? Because staff practice, I love that. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody had their role, whether it's for game and also staff. So somebody might be in charge of rebounding. Somebody might be in charge of making strong cuts, whether it's cutting to the basket or whether it's cutting to set a screen. So everybody knew what their roles were. And then during practice, sometimes I would go sit up in the stands and just let my assistants go. So I like to take a step back at times and just watch and then give them a critique after practice and say, and I did this a lot with, um, you know, we all do position work usually with our positions, guards and posts and wings. And then I vowed that I would keep my mouth shut while they did their position work. We'd talk ahead of time, you know, when we were working on our practice, what needed to be worked on, but then giving them the freedom to really design the drills, make sure we're getting the most out of the drills. And then I'd go sit in stands and I'd watch and I'd cheer. I was a cheerleader. But then after practice, I'd say, you know, maybe we could adjust this a little bit. So basically letting them lead, letting them be the teachers that they are and then and helping them to grow because many of my assistants, not all, but wanted to be head coaches, you know, so you as a head coach, you have a responsibility, I think, to to really help them grow along the way. And I think that's a big struggle for a lot of assistant coaches is that they want to be head coaches, but especially in the NCAA game, it's more about recruiting than it is about coaching to a certain extent. So it's really hard for them to get any meaningful reps as a basketball coach. So doing what you're doing obviously gives them some meaningful reps. And then the other part that goes with that, and we're going to dive into this, is evaluation. Evaluation, which is awesome. What did you do to evaluate yourself as a coach during the season? Let's say post game. Well, I always talked with my staff because they were the people I trusted most. So I usually thought I was terrible after every game. So (laughs) Spoken like a true coach, spoken like a true coach. (laughs) There's one, you know, one play you wish you would have changed this or that or defensive stop that you didn't get, you know, just different things. But I would always ask my staff, okay, you know, what do you think? Should I have made this call here? Is there something else we could have done? What about the substitution? So I, I needed feedback from the people that I trusted, which were my assistants. So, and there were many times when I would tell my team after a loss, you know, I might say, you know what, I wouldn't, y'all didn't do great, but you're, you know, I didn't do great either. I made mistakes. So we'll all get better, you know, just taking responsibility. But then without fail, I could not sleep at night, win or lose until I watched the video again. So I had what my assistants felt, you know, right after the game, but I had to go through, break down the video just to feel better, you know, knowing what I needed to work on as a coach, what we needed to work on as a staff and as a team. So first I would go to the people I trusted and then I would reevaluate by watching tape because we all know tape doesn't lie. And have you, uh, so for players then, what's the evaluation process? Like, how do you help them individually? Because I I think as coaches, we tend to focus on evaluation post-game more from a group team perspective. And Mm -hmm. inevitably, we always say it's not about outcome, but inevitably outcome influences it. But what are some things individually that you do to help players post-game in terms of evaluation? Well, we always did tape, even before every practice, I would break down the tape of the practice before. So, and then I would always have, this is, this is as a team, I would always have plays of excellence and plays for improvement. So that's how we always started practice after we have, you know, our team meeting and we might do a book report and um, some other things, then we would, okay, now let's go watch some video. And it would always be, I always made no more than 10 minutes, usually five, because, you know, the attention span and we're, we're ready to get after it. But, and I always started with plays for improvement because I always wanted to end on a positive note, plays of excellence. So we would go out onto that court knowing, okay, these are things we didn't do as well as we wanted to. Here's some great things we did. And now it's going to be reflected in our practice, things that we need to work on. But then individually, a couple of things. One, we had players that were assigned to several different players. So we'd have academic team. So one of my assistants might be in charge of three players academically. Okay. They would not be the same three that she might be in charge of if she was in charge of the point guards. So they were getting touches basically with all my different staff members. But what we did a lot more than individual, if somebody was struggling, 
or wants the individual attention, we would do individual video, but a lot of times we break them down into, okay, your academic teams, you're actually going to watch video today. Or by position work, you're going to guard, you're going to go with one of my coaches, post, you're going to go with another coach, wings, you're going to go with another. So we would break them down into groups many times of three or four so they could watch their position. So they'd have the team as a whole, things they were doing well, things they needed to work on. And then as groups, a lot of times we'd have the breakout groups where they'd go. That was at a different time. And then individually, if they needed it and when they needed it. I tended to meet more with my point guards because I was a point guard because they needed to be the coach on the floor. So there were many times when I would just take the point guards because I wanted to watch video with them because I wanted them to see what I was seeing. Let's shift a little bit because, I mean, you're you're such a valuable resource with with all these experiences. And, you know, having said you've watched so many practices, you've participated in so many practices. So maybe uh, as a reflective exercise, what are some styles or things that technically or tactically stand out for you that you can share with coaches that might be best practices for coaches, in your opinion, of, of things that you see that would be, hey, if I went back and I was the head coach of a team right now, I would do this because I thought saw this and this was awesome. Are there some things that stand out to you that uh, technically and tactically, uh, maybe you know how you defend ball screen or different plays or different actions, things that uh, have really stood out? I would say that I would definitely, I, we were up-tempo. I was an up-tempo coach, but I think I would take it into another gear and just run a lot of uh, drag screens, double drags. I love to step up screens, just constantly in attack mode, primary break, secondary break, and then allow the players to play more. I had a lot of sets. Which which worked for us, but going back now, I would prefer to just teach the players how to play the game and then let them play the game. That's when it's the most fun. That's the when it's the most exciting. And I think that's when you can get the most out of your players. Now, I'm still going to take advantage of mismatches. You know, you're going to have your sets when you want to get somebody in foul trouble or you've got a big mismatch and you know you can take advantage of it. But generally speaking, a lot of the early stuff uh, that the pros do, the d- drags, double drag, step ups, those are the keys. The pin down screen, it doesn't take a genius. You know, sometimes we make the game so complicated and it's really not that hard. If you set one or two good screens, you're going to get a great shot. If you set it up, set it and use it. So really just other than spacing and attacking, I think offensively, I, I'd really look to kick it up a notch like the pros do. I, I always like changing defense, and I think I would still like to do that. The pros, you don't see much zone at all because they have defensive three seconds. They don't have that in college, so I'm a fan of switching things up. Every time out, every free throw, I like to switch things up. I would probably do more trapping. And I think I would attack more defensively. And by that, I mean, I would do what the pros do and that, you know, you have your star defense. If there's somebody really good, I'm just going to go get them. I'm just going to go trap them. And then I'm going to really work on our rotations. So I think they do the best job of really uh, clogging up too. You know, you see that a lot when people are driving, you know, they show and go. and, And I think they do a great job with that. So just some different minor things, but I think it could make a big difference. Coach, let's, let's talk. There's a lot of young coaches that listen to this podcast. What's some of the best advice you can give young coaches at this point, being a consultant, but also uh, being a mentor and being someone who's obviously had an incredibly successful coaching career? Well, I guess I would say, first and foremost, you know, know who you are, you know, develop a mission statement, who you are and what you stand for. And then always go back to that mission statement, because sometimes we get lost along the way, you know, either with a big recruit that you want to sign or, you know, you see some success and, or some failure and you forgot really who you are and and what you stand for. So I think that's probably the first and most important thing I would say. And then I would say, you know, think about, write down, verbalize your short and your long-term goals, you know, so this is who I am and this is, this is what I want to accomplish. You know, what does success mean to you? Is it the scoreboard or is it more than that? And really have a heart to heart with yourself and with others, you know, that you trust. And then I would say hire to your weaknesses, you know, don't hire to your strengths. So many people just hire their, their friends 
because it's people that they feel like they can trust. And I know trust is paramount, but you also need to hire people that can have open, honest, and very difficult conversations with you. You know, they, they will make you better because they're going to make you think. So, and then that's the other thing. You've got to be willing to have those conversations. I think one thing I've seen at times is head coaches that have a hard time having hard conversations. And I think communication is paramount. You've got trust and you've got communications. And those two things, you're not going to go very far if you don't have or are not effective with those things because there are things that are going to go wrong. And instead of wiping them under the rug, you're going to have to be proactive in your conversations and be willing to have open, honest conversations with your, whether it's with your assistants, whether it's with your players, it doesn't matter. But those things, some people want to, they have an aversion to conflict. Well, conflict really can be a great teacher. So you have to be willing to have those conversations. Have a vision. No, you know, this is the way we want to play. This is, and then make your plan. And then you've got to follow through on that plan. You know, you've got to have a great work ethic, obviously, but you got to trust yourself because there are always going to be those that are going to doubt you. And then I would say always to seek advice from others, you know, that have been there and, and that have done it. So you can't be on an island. You know, you've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. You've got to be willing to learn, to open up, to say, hey, I messed up. You know, I made a mistake. People really will care about you when you show them that you are vulnerable. You don't have to have all the answers. Nobody's got all the answers. Great stuff. And the, the, the natural that goes with that is that what advice is there for coaches in transition? You, it's realities of coaching at your level that there's going to be transition from one job to the next, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. And uh, is there some certain things that have, have helped you in that process or other coaches that you've worked with? Well, I think, I think if you see life as an adventure, you know, and when one door closes, as they say, another door will open, but you can't see it as, as an end. You need to see it as a new beginning. So whether you're taking another job, whether you quit or been fired, whatever the case may be, or you've just retired, it's got to be the beginning of something else. So you're still looking forward instead of looking backward. And then it is an adventure. So, you know, when I decided to leave Texas, I took classes, I went to retreats, I coached in, that's when I decided, you know, coached in the WNBA, did some ESPN, but it was, it was an adventure. I, I never really left basketball. Now I'm doing the consulting, but I wanted to see what else is there. I've been doing this for 27 years. Is there something else or different that I'm supposed to be doing? So it's just been an adventure. It's been very interesting because I've stayed with the game and I've learned so much through every little piece that I've gone through. It's made me a better person. It's made me a better coach. You know, I, and it never would have happened had I not taken the chance and said, you know what, I, I need to go see if there's something more out there. Yeah, no, good, good, good advice for all coaches and great philosophy to live life in general. Forget about just coaching. Just treat it like an adventure and uh, wonderful stuff. So coach, uh, maybe again, because you've had these diverse experiences, what are some, some really cool things or neat things you've seen in terms of team building, team cohesion, you know, whatever you want to hit on in terms of that. But uh, coaches generally, again, they, they kind of always are searching for an idea and there's no dominant idea that's always going to work, but uh, what are some things that you've seen that have uh, intrigued you? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, one of the things, a lot of people are doing the ROTC now with their players. They're doing some Navy SEAL things. They're taking them boxing, uh, boxing classes, um, yoga classes. So these are all things that I've seen from some of the coaches we work with, which has been fantastic. Um, I always had my team do a Susan G. Coleman run. Um, They had one in Austin, which was bonding because it was a 5K. You know, (laughs) they weren't they weren't always excited about it, but they were happy to help with the cause. So and there's when you accomplish something you don't think you can do, there's always a uh, bonding that goes on as a team. I also had my team do journaling. 
so when they come in as freshmen, I give them all a journal and I ask them different questions. And every year they keep their journal all four years. And every year I ask them different questions. So it always starts with am dot, 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 and they have to fill it in because I want to know who are they? Who do they think they are? How do they feel about themselves? And then I might ask them, you know, what's your greatest fear on the court? And then what's your greatest fear off the court? You know, what's your best memory? So I just ask a variety of questions. They write them down. They give them back to me. And then when we have our individual meetings, I talk about it. It helps me get to know them at the deepest level, which is the most important level. And then, like I said, as sophomores, same thing. So, And then when they graduate and I give their journals back to them, they're usually almost filled up because I've asked them so many questions uh, over the course of their four years. So that's something that I think is, it's relationship building is what it is. So it's not so much team building, but it's relationship building that has, has been something very worthwhile for me. So just a variety of things now that a lot of coaches now have the ability to hire team building coaches. So, you know, whether they're going out bowling together as a team or they play wiffle ball as a team. We used to do that as well. We play some football, uh, flag football, not tackle. (laughs) Um, So just different things to get the team together off of the court so that they can, they can really bond. I want to dive into that journaling thing a little bit because uh, you, my wife is big into journaling. My six and eight, eight year old daughters journal for whatever level they can at this point. And uh, there's tons of research behind it that a great way to manage stress. But I think what you're talking about in particular there is like this old quote that if we don't write things down, we miss the patterns. And I'm curious right. with the journaling part of it, it's a reflective exercise. It's an analytic exercise, but are you actively involved in that? Are you, are you looking at their journals or the personal? Private? I am. Okay. So you're involved yeah. in this. No, problem. they know. Yeah. Yes. They know yeah. from, from the get go that they're going to hand them back to me. I'm going to look through them and then we're going to meet, you know, just individually. And we're just going to talk about life, you know, nothing about basketball, just about life, but the journal is going to guide me in directions so that we can expand more on what they're saying, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And the follow-up with that then is, do you find that they become more open the longer they're with you? Is that generally the pattern that it goes or, or is it? Absolutely. Some, and are there some things to speed up that process that you found successful to get them to open up? Mm, I think it's just being a good listener, which is something fortunately I, I think I've always been is, because I want to find out what makes people tick. So if you ask good questions and if you keep your mouth shut, you'll find out a great deal about what's in somebody's heart, mind, and soul. So um, I think there's nothing that speeds it along, but letting them, you might have to guide it, you know, to open things up, but the more they talk, the more comfortable they get. Um, it's a, it can be a really a beautiful thing. Most, most meaningful thing probably for me when I think, when I reflect, you know, you talked about reflecting on my coaching career. It wasn't about the wins and most coaches say that, you know, it wasn't about any of that. It was really about your relationships with your players, but you have to take the time to really get to know the players and, and it takes time, you know, and one of the things I say now to, to the coaches we're working with, you have to re-recruit your players daily because I think it's gotten to the point sometimes where people are so busy recruiting that they forget once they come on campus, you're the caretaker for them. You're their parents away from home. And I think so much growth happens from the age of 18 to 22. So it's a very fragile time for them. They're learning to be strong, independent, hopefully strong, independent, confident people. And if you have a tiny, teeny, tiny little role in making that happen, helping that to happen, not making it, but helping it to happen, that's priceless. Well, I'm so glad you brought this out because I think, again, this is something like, like, even though there's research, there's evidence, like meditation is one of the most powerful things we can do on a daily basis. Journaling is another thing, tons of evidence and some, tons of research. And it may not be something that we consider valuable to, to spend our time on. But I, I think about this in the sense that It's really hard to get most people that age group, high school, college level, to open up and have conversation. So this, Mm -hmm. what you're doing, is stimulating questions and conversations, and they're probably sharing more than they would in a one-on-one conversation. And that's Mm -hmm. 
got to be incredibly beneficial for you to be able to have insights in towards coaching them. Absolutely. You know, everybody is motivated differently. So until you know somebody's hopes, dreams, and fears, you can't properly motivate them. You've got to be able to speak and teach in a way that they can hear. Uh, it's tremendous. I hope coaches really go in and investigate that. And uh, such a valuable thing if you're not doing it to have your player's journal on a daily basis. Coach, let's talk uh, about some of the lessons that you've learned along the way that, uh, that uh, you can help share with coaches to help them improve and develop and uh, move on in their careers. Well, I've learned so many, it's hard to <laughs> put in <laughs> of course. Uh, to be brief, but I, I will try. I guess just that every, everyone is a student, you know, and everyone is a teacher. So just because you're the head coach, you're also a student. And, and some of your greatest lessons can come from your players or your staff or anyone else you, you meet along the way. So everyone's a student, everybody is a teacher, and you've got to enjoy the journey. You know, basketball can be such a stressful, well, coaching in general can be very stressful. So it's like enjoy the journey because you never know when it will end. And that help everyone, everyone wants to be needed. They want to feel needed. So Try to help everyone feel needed from your star to the last person on the bench. If you can help them to feel needed, that is a great gift. And then I would say be open to any suggestions, to be open to ideas, be open to listening to your players, be hungry, be adaptable. And remember, it's all about relationships. I mean, that's why you're there. Find the best way to communicate in a way that can be heard expect the best from everyone, see the good, correct the bad, stay open. Everybody's got their own story. You know, you need to hear it. You need to respect it. Every day is a gift. And just be grateful that you have the opportunity to coach young people and to do something that you're passionate about and, and you love. And, and just remember all the gifts that, that the game has given you. Well, I'm grateful for you for coming on and sharing so many of these ideas and a lot of practical, actionable things. That's that's tremendous. Uh, I know you're going to get uh, some people inquiring, and uh, let, let's cover it again. Where can they find you on social media? Where they can they find you uh, in terms of consulting right now? If someone was want to work with you, or someone was want to reach out and find out more information, probably the best is just to IM me directly, which is at Gail Goes Ten. Perfect. And then I'll get it to my coaching full circle. <laughs> That's awesome. Coaching full circle and Coach G, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to have you on here. And we look forward to uh, following your journey along the, this path that you're on now as well. Thanks so much, Chris. Take care. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations. So connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.